Well, after that year of college, I um, came home and was going to a local college back home and uh, designed a little computer of my own. I designed a lot of computers, but I could never talk the local silicon companies, the local integrated circuit companies, into giving me the parts I needed to build my own computer. Um, I was a little too vague on what I needed. So anyway, I finally designed one and managed to get Signetics, I think, to give me a few parts. And it was a very tiny 8-bit computer. And what it was when it was done was it was pretty small. It had a bunch of switches on the front and a bunch of lights, just like mini computers. And it had an instruction set of my own design. And what you would do to load a first program into it, let's say you wanted to load a program in that was 20 bytes long. You would toggle the code for one of the bytes on the switches. There were no such things as video terminals back in 1970. There were no such things as affordable teletypes. And I had no money at all. I had to, to use what I could beg and borrow. So there was, the only input device was these switches. And you'd toggle a code on them, one byte, and push a button, and the byte would go into memory where you wanted it to. You'd toggle another code, push a button, and that byte goes into memory. And you could load a little 20-byte program into memory. Maybe it did some little tricky thing like a multiply. And you could push another button, and it would run. And you could actually watch it working. And it turns out that it didn't matter that it did nothing useful. It did only something that, you, that I knew this was a computer. That was the only thing that matters. All the rewards of computers were intrinsic. It didn't have to accomplish something to the outside world. It didn't have to earn money. It didn't have to start a company. It didn't have to get a, a, a career or get a job. <coughs> it was a computer, and I was uh, very proud of that. The trouble is, after it was done, you sort of think, well, what can I do beyond this? What can I do next? And the ideas that came into my head and a friend that was working on it with me were, you can add a keyboard, number one. And I started thinking, what's the only, I had no money. If you've got no money, what sort of in output device can you possibly get? You cannot afford a teletype to print answers out. And there were, the video terminals were not around yet. Well, I started thinking, and I finally figured out that I knew how to build a little circuit that could, if I attached it to my oscilloscope, I, I could always borrow an oscilloscope, and it had x, y coordinates. And I could just draw that trace over and start drawing characters. So I started designing a circuit that would print numbers, numbers only, onto an oscilloscope screen, but never got around to building it. It was an important stage to go through in 1970. The rest of the world was going to go through that stage in 1975. Next, uh, around that time, the friend who helped me build that cream soda computer, because we drank cream soda all the time while we worked on it, um, introduced me to another friend of his, Steve Jobs. The reason he introduced us was we had a couple things in common. We had gone to the same high school, although we didn't know each other, and we had electronics and pranks. <laughs> well, one of the first things, you know, Steve and I just talked about all sorts of electronic issues and counters and where you could get LED displays and drivers and all this. And, <coughs> and uh, um, so we were heavily into electronics fun for ourselves. Nothing, you know, official or serious. One day, I was picked up a magazine, and I started reading a story about phone freaks and blue boxes. A blue box, in theory, this was a fiction article. It was labeled fiction. But a blue box was a little device that put special tones into anybody's phone, and those tones would start making the entire phone circuitry of the entire phone system of the world connect you anywhere you wanted, on any paths you wanted, and go around the world as many times as you wanted, and somehow you could, it was a big, it was the most amazing fiction I'd ever read. And the heart of this fiction was a little, an engineer named Captain Crunch. And supposedly, if you read this thing, he drove around the country in his VW van, packed with racks of electronics equipment, because he was the brightest telephone engineer that ever existed. And he would clamp into pay phones out in some lonely Utah desert, Colorado desert. And he would, and he would start setting up networks with, with 20 different phone freaks, all talking to each other, sharing information, passing codes, and connected all over the world. And it was an intriguing story. Before I was halfway through reading this piece of fiction, I called Steve Jobs on the phone and started reading it to him over the phone. How Captain Crunch would talk about, I'm not in it to hurt Ma Bell. I only want to explore the system. The phone company is a computer, a system. And I like to explore computers and find all the little bugs and all, where all the little, little alleyways of this whole system go and find where the network connects. And I don't really ever want to hurt Ma Bell, kind of a love-hate relationship. And it was just so intriguing to read this kind of stuff. Well, as I was talking to Steve Jobs on the phone, I said, 
it occurred to me that, wait a minute, there's, they're giving too much information about certain frequencies and certain codes. There's too much information here. This doesn't sound right for a fiction. And so we decided to go check some of it out. So on a Sunday, we went to, where, where's the technical library you can sneak into on a Sunday? Well, we picked the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. <laughs> no question, you go to any of these places, you know, in the, the, the high research, the very pure theoretical research type places, and boy, I'll tell you, there's no such thing as a closed door or a locked door. So we always found our way in. And we'd go up to the library and read all the computer magazines every week, and went, we found a book on the telephone system and it had the same frequencies that were mentioned in this article that was called fiction. And we looked at each other and realized that we had stumbled onto something that was not fiction. So we started, we figured out how to build a blue box and we actually built one and we could make phone calls anywhere we wanted for free. And we, uh, we also managed to meet Captain Crutch, but we had a very interesting philosophy about it, a very pure philosophy. We would go out to pay phones night after night after night and start learning talk, which is by experimenting. We'd learn how to talk to operators in London and to transfer us over to Tokyo, and Tokyo back to London, London to Tokyo. Background, we started calling all the different dial-a-discs uh, dial and dial-a-jokes and dial-a-songs all over the world, from Australia to, to Hong Kong to wherever. And we did this to explore everything we could do. We tried to do something new that we hadn't done before. But when we came back to the dorm, and Steve went back to his home, when I called my relatives, I called my parents, I called my friends, I called Steve himself. We never used the blue box. We paid for our phone calls. I had a very high phone bill. The idea was the blue box was an incredible tool to explore a world of fantasy and imagination, and the tip, but not to rip off the phone company. You know, also you're a little afraid to make calls on your own phone and, and get caught. <laughs> So we had a lot of fun, you know, we did a lot of demonstrations of blue boxes and convinced, you know, we were just MCs and we were just the most incredible, we'd do jokes for, for an hour and we would always force, we'd, we'd get a group of 20 people in one dorm and it was pretty amazing how we were very careful to be selective enough that we never got caught. We'd get 20 people in there and we'd connect them all to different countries and one, one phone after another up and down the hall and uh, we'd just joke after joke, we always forced them to record it and never once did we ever not sell a blue box the next day. <laughs> so, uh, Steve went off to college, Reed College in Portland, Oregon. He was much more of a free spirit regarding schooling than I was. He went, he went and signed up for some standard first year courses, but he only attended other courses that he wasn't assigned up for that he wanted to. So he never did, did the normal schooling in addition to what he felt was worthwhile, like Shakespeare courses and whatnot. So he didn't go very far in school, like maybe a day or two. <laughs> I, I, I went to, uh, uh, after the year at University of California at Berkeley, that was my third year of college, good grades, computer science curriculum. Uh, I wound up taking a couple of jobs to earn some money for my fourth year of school, and things go on and start progressing in your career, and it can be very difficult to get back for a long time. I wound up at Hewlett Packard, working as an engineer, helping design calculator circuits for their scientific calculators. One year before, they had introduced the HP 35 calculator, <clears throat> and it was taking the world by storm. It was causing dramatic social revolutions. It was very clear that slide rules would be obsolete within a few years, and they were. I was so intrigued by this being the most incredible product I'd ever seen in my life, and I was so delighted to be able to get a job to work there. So uh, I worked on doing logic design on some of the circuits. In the meantime, I got a little bit out of my computer background. I didn't follow the mini computers of where they were going. They were just getting a little too big to be interesting anymore. It was not, you know, the new machines where you can think about where 4K of RAM will go and how a basic compiler can actually work in 4K. Well, so I started, uh, my electronics interest, my electronics hobby turned towards other pursuits. In a bowling alley, saw the first version of Palm, and it was a little taken by it. it it's very grabbing, and it shook you the first time you ever saw it. My God, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, well, I sat there and I said something else. I said, I took electronics in high school. I know how TV signals work and I know how to design computer circuits. I'm gonna build a Pong. So that was my goal, to build a very simple with very few circuits Pong game. And the only two circuits that were probably optional that I put in were ones that, if you said, they were a couple of proms. The biggest prom you could possibly think of getting or affording in those days was 256, by four. That's only half of 256 bytes on one prom. Very difficult to get. EROMs were not affordable by individuals. 
So I got two of these problems because we used them in our calculator lab. And when you missed the ball, and the only reason I learned how to program the problems was when you missed the ball, it would say, oh darn, or something a little stronger. <laughs> it was a very useful experience leading into building a computer, an individual computer that had a prom built in. Um, one day, Steve Jobs got it. He would get jobs at Atari on and off and work as somewhere between technician and engineer, trying to get products into development and hustling things around. And he became very enamored by the Atari culture of the early days, and especially the founder, Nolan Bushnell, whom he was very close to. And, and he just uh, knew all the top people, and he's just a very persuasive, high energy person who gets into the, the deepest levels of everything. He came to me one day and said, Nolan Bushnell has this game that he wants done called Breakout. Or they were thinking at first of calling it brick out. A bunch of bricks and a little ball that bounces around. And Steve said, said, look, I, I've seen you design stuff and you know you're, you're far ahead of me. So I said, could you design this thing? And I said, well, yeah, boy, I'd just love to, just to show that I can design it. You know, no more motivation other than that. Steve said, well, he'll pay us seven hundred dollars if we give them a working breadboard. And if it's under 40 chips, they'll give us a thousand dollars. And you know, and the, it could have been 20 cents. I could care less. The challenge was more the more the intrigue. But Steve said there's one problem. He said he had to go to Oregon in four days to work on some friend's farm. I think he probably had to buy some buy into it or something. And he needed money in four days. So we had four days to sit down from scratch, design a game in very few chips because that's what we were being paid for. That somebody else had defined exactly where the score was on the screen. In other words, you couldn't save one chip to move the score you had to put it where it was intended to be. Very difficult task for four days. Well, got right on it. We both stayed up all night long, four nights in a row. Catch a couple of winks of sleep in the morning. That was about it. We both got mononucleosis from it. And we, were, we were really stressing ourselves, but we, fit, we, we actually did design it. <coughs> Tari had to, I think, redesign it somewhat. They said their engineers saw it and they couldn't figure out the design. So I, I, I know that it was mine. <laughs> went over to, around this time, went over to Captain Crunch's basement one night. He's sitting there on a teletype, which was the only affordable input-output devices. There were some video terminals around, but they were still many times, you know, like, it was like $1,500 for a teletype and $3,000 for a video terminal. Much more expensive. So the teletype would clunk, 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 type 10 characters per second. Very slow. Well, I, saw, I went down to his basement, and he's there typing away playing chess. And he's yapping about this network, ARPANET, and how you can connect to computers all over the country, and you just log into them, and they have guest accounts, and they make certain programs available, or games, or files available to look at and explore. And you know, you, can't, you cannot delete anything from it. It's a guest system. You don't have access to their whole computer. And uh, I became so intrigued by the fact that these are computer games. And I've been in intrigued already by uh, the video games coming along. Computer games in that day, could not have flying saucers flying around because they don't fly around very good on a teletype. <laughs> the games of that day would print out a line that would give you a little hint of information. And the biggest game of the, that ever came along of that style was Adventure. But it would give you a little bit of information. You'd type an answer or a guess, and then it would give you more information. And you'd try to work your way through unseen mazes and the like. But it was only text. It would talk to you. You would talk back. Nothing moved in a graphic sense. Um, it was still, that was the uh, object to do. Well, Crunch would also phone a local time-sharing outlet that had a local, low-cost computer available. And uh, he would play games on that one. Well, it became my goal. I wanted a terminal now. I can play games right in my house if I have a terminal. And I can impress everybody because there isn't one person in maybe a thousand to a million that does this. So I designed myself a terminal. And I designed a modem and, uh, of course, I couldn't afford an input-output device of any sort at all, so I designed it to attach to my TV set using a little character generator ROM to put characters on the TV set at home. If you own a TV set, your cost was zero, and that was all I could afford. <coughs> the year is 1975, and uh, video display terminals, little video terminals that you can build in your, your home have been catching the public eye in uh, the hobbyist magazines like Popular Electronics and Radio Electronics, and you could actually build it for yourself. For a couple hundred bucks, you can build a terminal and tons of parts and soldering it together, but eventually it uses your TV set and you can actually afford it. Um, a bunch of computers started coming out around this time. 
And they had come out just preceding 1975, but the big computer that came out was called the Altair 8800. And let me describe it. It looked pretty much like a microprocessor-based mini-computer. It looked like all the other mini-computers that had been in existence for the last seven years. It was a big, square, rectangular box with the exact same row of switches on the front, the exact same row of lights on the front, and a ton of slots that someday you can plug things in when they come, become available. The computer was first introduced as a simple little machine with 256 bytes of RAM and switches to toggle bytes in and lights to look at what's there and not a single board available. This product caught on like wildfire. It was three to four hundred dollars. All of a sudden, this world who had been excluded from computers, they cost millions of dollars. You were not allowed to get near the computer at school or at work. There were computing departments that you had to go through to get your access. All of a sudden, you could own a computer. And the only thing that mattered was, by the definition of computer, it's a computer. It didn't matter that it could do something. You didn't have to say it can play a game. You didn't have to say it can do my financing. It can, it can, uh, it can do some, some calculation for me. It didn't even have to uh, do my math homework. It's a computer. I can show it to friends and say, this is actually a computer. Inter the hobbyists that got onto the first one started writing interesting programs that would play tunes on the computer, and, and eventually some plug-in boards came out to add memory, to add a video terminal came out. A couple of video terminals that you could plug in and have a video terminal, but nobody accepted the fact yet that the video terminals were finally inexpensive enough that they ought to be built into every single one of these computers. About 20 computers of this sort came out. They were all kits. The Apple One is going to be the first break from the kit world. They were all kits, meaning you were expected to take a soldering iron and bolt, bolt all the transformers in place and the capacitors and solder all the wires and connect up huge wires up to your front panel. And then you'd have to toggle the switches to try to get it to work. I mean, it was a nightmare for anyone except for a technician. But they were flooded with orders. Every little startup that was just a guy who was trying to do one little individual thing that he thought had some hobby basis, not a business. Every little guy instantly found that he was flooded with hundreds or thousands of orders. And it was like became a nightmare. How do you actually manufacture something? Nobody really knew that was involved in this business. Companies like Hewlett Packard, whom I worked for, didn't think it was going to be a big dollar volume consumer business that it became in 1975. TI, um, IBM, you know, large companies like that did not foresee what was going to happen. Um, the first, the first, you have to build an infrastructure of person, small, these were called, let's call these kit computers. The kit computer enthusiasts, we were the fringe element of the technical company. We were, you know, probably long hairs and walked around in jeans with holes in them, and all we cared about was the neatest new little technical design or somebody's little algorithm trick or a clever little thing with code that he wasn't supposed to be able to do or a new chip that was available for two dollars. That's all we cared about. We weren't very much into, you know, all, all the product and marketing considerations and all that. We came out of the hobbyist magazines. Popular Electronics had the Altair computer on its front cover, and that's really the biggest kick that this, this whole thing had back then. A ham radio magazine called 73 Magazine, and this is for, you know, this is for soldering iron folks. Um, the publisher, Wayne Green, decided personal computers, all these little computer kits and computer circuits were becoming such a big thing, he would start the first magazine that would start this national infrastructure, and it was called Byte. And, of course, for tax reasons, his accountants told him, put it in your wife's name, and then they got divorced. <laughs> so he's still searching for his, you know, perfect, uh, perfect magazine name key there. Um, all the products were very hot and the markets were instantaneous, but the companies were not professionally managed. They were just people who knew how to buy a bunch of parts, shove them in bags, and fulfill an order that was in the back page in a little type in some hobbyist magazine. They didn't know anything about producing products. The Homebrew Computer Club started. It was probably the first in the country, or at least one of the first, and that was in our Silicon Valley area. A lot of, oddly enough, a lot of um, um, almost, you know, radicals, peace and freedom types were sort of around. In other words, organizing a social structure was, was sort of half the leadership of this club as it started, as well as the technical side of things. And uh, it was very anarchistic. Every meeting, the leader, Lee Felsenstein, would get up and announce, this is the Homebrew Computer Club, which does not exist. And everyone would applaud for half a minute. We, can, we did not want to consider ourselves a thing, an official organization with some rule of organization. Um, 
We started out with about 20 members in a garage, and just and I was a little shocked. I got there by accident. A friend of mine saw an ad for this computer club that was going to start, and he knew that I had built a terminal. So he said, why don't you come to this meeting? There's a bunch of people interested in terminals. He didn't say microprocessors, because he knew if he'd said that, I would have been scared out of it, because I didn't know anything about them. So I went down expecting to show off my terminal, and I was a little shocked. Everybody's talking about microprocessors. And I'm saying, what are they? What's an 8080? What's an 8008? And I, I started finding all these high school kids knew microseconds and instructions and registers and all the names of them, and I'd been out of it for too long. So I got a couple of data sheets and went home and studied, and I figured out this is exactly what I spent my life intending to do. I've been writing programs for every mini computer in the world that I could never run them on, and all of a sudden, microprocessors were becoming affordable, and I could write the same programs. So this was, uh, my life was going to be very ch altered. Our, the way our club worked is we had about an hour of a mapping period. And it was just communication. The theme of the club was give something to the others. Give something they'll enjoy or give to help them. So people would stand up and say, I've got some parts for sale. Or somebody would stand up, I've got some information on how to do a certain thing. Other people would stand up and say, I've got a 35 teletype. How do I connect it to a certain interface board? And everyone would get together later in the random access period, meet and talk and get questions answered. And we'd occasionally have demos from the major companies that had products in this very tiny industry at the time. They would come to the homebrew club, the, the key people in the world. Um, the guys who invented the, the Z80 microprocessor before it was even out would come and talk to our club about it. And it was just in incredible to see such high-ranging personalities. Jeff Raskin would show up from the University of California, San Diego, and march back and forth on the stage and describe his little flow language and all these. And he, it was so intriguing to see people who were such good presenters of technical information. The club was the major social event of our lives, met every two weeks. Um, a few of us, about a year later, there might, the club grew to about 500 members. Very incredible. We never thought that, that many people could possibly be interested in computers for the home, computers an individual could have and afford and own. We never thought that it could be that big. And all of a sudden, but it grew to 500 people, but the funny thing is, who were we? We weren't mainstream people who had jobs, who had money. We were just the fringe. I mean, e even myself. I mean, I had so many bad checks, my apartment made me pay cash. <laughs> so, uh, even by the time we grew to 500 members, only about five to eight of us actually owned our computers. Yet. Every single member in the audience was going to get a computer. So I'll, I'll take a little break right here. How many of you own computers? How many people want a Macintosh? <laughs> Good percentage. Giving them away. Okay. Anyway, this was uh, our club was our way to get together and, and help other people. And if, if you wrote a program, you, you gave it away. You published it in the newsletter. If it was a little too long for that, you passed out copies to people. It was like just sort of neat to have other people that shared your interest that you could help with something that you were sort of had some expertise in. Um, I started working. I started thinking uh, I was going to build a microprocessor. I couldn't really afford to buy these kits, even for a few hundred dollars. And I had to find something. To buy a microprocessor, it was only set up to where it came from Intel, and you had to look like a company. You had to go down to an Intel distributor and fill out a whole bunch of credit applications that sort of didn't fit an individual lifestyle who's used to buying stuff at a surplus store or at a grocery store. It was like odd to have accounts. What are all these things? I just want to give you some money. Of course, the 8080 microprocessor in single quantity cost $400. So it was absolutely prohibitive. There was no way to afford it by that processor. 6502 microprocessor was introduced that year, 1975, and it was supposedly the best. It had claims of being, for certain reasons, the best, or at least one of the best, an adequate 8-bit microprocessor. And they were going to sell it. Their, their marketing, their introduction plan was the most astounding introduction plan of any component ever. They were going to show up at an electronic show called Westcon in San Francisco and have a little suite on the side where they would sell it to you for a $20 bill right over the counter. My friends and I from HP went down there and we bought them for $20 over the counter. We bought our 6502s and 6501s and we bought some manuals, started studying them. Well, I became very intrigued by I was finally getting back into computers. I started studying the instruction set because instruction sets are the, the most important element of any processor. And I set out, I had a goal all my life. I would sit in the back of class and I would write Fortran compilers for a Nova computer, but I could never ever run it because I never knew where a Nova computer was. I could never afford to get near one, but I would do these. And even to the point that teachers got very mad at me for not paying attention to them in class, 
because this was the thing in life that I wanted to do so badly. I just wanted to teach myself how to do it. I didn't get it from books. Anyway, that was fortunate on occasion. Anyway, uh, I sat down and I, I had noticed something had happened. The, of all the kit computers, there were, the big standout was the Altair computer. And a company called Microsoft had come out with a basic for it. The way they sold the basic was not on floppy disks. There were no floppy disks yet for inexpensive computers. The cassette tapes hadn't really come along. It was not on cassette tape. It was on paper tape that if you had a teletype, the standard low-cost input-output device of the day, if you had a teletype, you could read the paper tape in it. It would take 20 minutes and it would load all the bytes into memory and it would run basic. Very clumsy process. Well, our club bought one copy of it and one day Dan borrowed it, took it home and he worked at a company that had a high-speed paper tape punch. So he came back the next meeting and he brought 20 copies back. <laughs> And there was no real understanding. There were no guidelines as to what was going on. What did it mean? It just, I mean, here it was, and why was the basic, why did the basic cost more than the computer? Was one of the, one of the questions that people had. Well, um, the rule in the club sort of became, you can take the tape, you can take a copy of the tape out of the club library, but the rule was you had to bring two back. <laughs> and it actually worked. Anyway, this basic had been, I, I could not understand why. All my life, I had been a computer science major. It was Fortran and Algo were the main ones. I'd done a little PL1. Basic, I never even learned because basic was, you know, the little education line. It was too simple and it had all these problems and it wasn't structured. It didn't have subroutines or the equivalent. It was very difficult. I mean, it was not like Fortran subroutines. It had nothing equivalent to, you know, local variables and computer science, good organized terms. But it was obvious. All the magazines that were starting to come out had huge listings of programs written in basic that would play games on your computer. The entire world had jumped on this first language, and this was going to be the default standard for personal computers. It had been so successful, I got a neat little idea in my head. What if I write the first basic for the 6502? Okay, whenever you're trying to be first to do something, you know you got a little lead and maybe and other people aren't into it. There's no contest even. You maybe just got a, an idea that you think is so right, and you're going to work so hard, you're going to find so much energy and so many hours in the day when you think that you're going to be first, and you're trying to be first. Because then you can go down to the club and show off, and say, look at this neat thing. Anyway, in about a month, I had the very minimum subset core of the basic written, and I was working very long hours. A friend of mine at Hewlett Packard wrote, wrote a program on the Hewlett Packard computer that simulated the 6502 microprocessor, and got it to the point that I thought my basic was going to work, but I had done something in the wrong order. Normally, you have a computer, and then you write the basic. Well, I had written the basic, but I had no computer yet. So I had to scramble because to demonstrate this thing at the club, I need a computer. So I had to design a computer, which was later to become the Apple I. And what I did was I just went the most expedient way I could. Took a video terminal I'd already designed, interfaced it to the 6502 microprocessor, which was the only one I could afford, and tacked on some memory. And for the first demonstration, I actually had to borrow memory because I couldn't afford any and uh, bought a keyboard for $60 that was advertised in Electronics Magazine. And I'd carry my big, huge Sears color TV down, and I, I modified the insides of it to connect some wires directly to it, and that was my input out, that was my video terminal. So it cost me almost nothing. Hewlett Packard had a formal policy that you could have an engineer, if it, if it was a design of their own, they felt the engineer was learning enough by it that they would let the lowest level supervisor decide if that engineer could have the parts out of the storeroom for free if it was for something of their own design. So, um, so fortunately, I could get all the other chips for free. So I had very little cost involved in building the Apple One computer. Took it down to the club, demonstrated running basic, but I had no tools. I couldn't afford the tools. To use it, the first assembler for the 6502, you had to call a time-sharing outlet and pay a lot of money, which I had none of, to use their assembler. And I couldn't afford to do that. Well, I discovered that you can actually sit down on paper and write a bunch of computer code on one side and all the little hexadecimal code numbers from a reference card on the other side, and you can actually do the assembler job by hand. So actually, right up to, through the monitors and the first basic we ever shipped with the Apple II computer, it was all written by hand without an assembler for first, first time through. There was no, I couldn't afford the tool. Um, also, could not, there were no floppy disks. There were no cassette tapes yet. I had to sit down, and how do you get three K bytes of a basic program into a computer when all you got is a keyboard. You want to know how? You type for an hour, if you're a fast typist. 
So I would go down to the computer club and I would be typing for an hour while they're doing everything else. They're inside at their meeting. And I would finally get my 3K basic running and it could be demonstrated. And, you know, friends would pop up. I, you know, I met a couple, of, a couple of high school kids, including Randy Wigginton, who's going to be addressing you a little bit later about some Macintosh issues. And uh, they, would, they would help out and sit down and write programs right on the site. And I was getting inspired by seeing other people actually use it.